Okay. So just to recap uh, a little bit from last time, uh, we started talking about communion, the Lord's Supper, and we went through some of the, the basic source texts in Scripture, which are the words of institution, right? The stuff that the pastor says when we celebrate communion in the service. Um, and we read the different, the three different gospel accounts of that, and then we started to get into 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is writing to the congregation in Corinth because he's been told by some people there that people are abusing the Lord's Supper. In other words, they're not celebrating according to the way that Jesus intended. Okay? And so right off the bat, there's an answer to our question, can we do the Lord's Supper incorrectly? The answer is yes, right? Uh, which means that it has some particulars to it and some rules, and we talked about a few of those, and we'll get into some more today. And where do we see those rules coming from? Do they come from the pastor? Do they come from the congregation? Where are those rules coming from? Jesus, right? What's the table called? It's called the Lord's table, right? If I was at Janine's house, it's Janine's table, right? And so would I come into her house or would you come into her house? Or if I'm going to Jim's house, it's Jim's table. And would you say, you know what? I don't like the way you set the table or arrange the chairs. I'm going to move that stuff around. Be your last invitation. There you go. Right? As the, as the guest invited to the table, that's not my place. Right? It's not my table. That's one of the reasons I like Lord's Supper and Lord's Table. It's a possessive way of saying and reminding us and me that it's not our table, right? It's God's table that we've been invited to. And he's invited us there for a particular thing, which is a wonderful thing for our good. Okay? And we also talked a little bit about, uh, just to kind of catch everyone up, even if you weren't here, that there is some confusion in the latter half of the 20th century about the role of worship when it comes to whether it's for the visitor and evangelism or whether it's for the members of the congregation and temple. And that has caused a lot of blurring of the lines, a lot of things in worship, because we have sort of moved them from something God intended to give to the believer and use them as a means for the visitor. Now, what are some of the potential issues that arise when we do that? Not just about communion, but any any element of the service when we do that. Well, communion is a statement of unity, and you presume you have unity with your fellow congregants. You don't really know if you have unity with the visitor. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's a tenuous statement. Right, right. Community or communion is a is a statement of unity of faith. Right, and for the visitor, we don't know if we have unity of faith. And also for their benefit, we don't want them to do something that communicates something that they don't believe. Maybe they'll visit it three or four times and realize, oh, this church believes this. I don't, I don't believe that. This isn't the place for me. Right? Um, and if that's the case, they shouldn't be communing with us because they're not coming in a, in a, uni in a unity with us. In a unity with us. Um, what else can be a problem when those lines get blurred between for the member versus for the visitor evangelistic. Yeah. Whether the uh, bread and wine represent the body of Christ or do they become Christ once you consume them? Right. Or in the, in the Catholic viewpoint, are they uh, God, are, are they Jesus as soon as they've been, you know, you know, pray, you know praying on, uh, you know, by the priest? Uh, it, it's a rough one. Right. So, but, so the, the confession, not only that they are making, but that we are making, right? And so, um, like, imagine that you're, you're with a friend at your church that has been coming recently, and there's a new person, and they ask questions about communion, and you say one thing, and your friend says another, and you both go to the same church. What is that people going to say? What is that person going to say? Confusion. They're going to be like, well, what is it? Which one? Okay. And so it actually harms our ability to witness about the truth of what's being given there because it causes confusion and doubt. Right? Um, 
The, another side effect of this is it, so this is, are either of those desires bad? The, no. the ones we're talking about, they're not, right? They're both good desires. Do we want people to know about Jesus? Yeah, we want them to be able to join us at the table. Yeah, yeah we do, right? But what happens when we blur the lines for what's intended for whom, you end up getting neither of those things. You get a fake image of both. So you're depriving yourself of things God wishes to give you in order to sustain your faith and encourage you in the faith. And you're also depriving them of the depth of the witness of the gifts of Jesus. Right? Um, because, like, the reason that we have the confession we have is because we believe it's the truth of the scriptures. Right? And that that truth is great. Like, this is the body and blood of Jesus, not some representation, not just a recollection of the sacrifice. But when you, when you receive this in faith, you're participating in the sacrifice for the atonement of all your sins. And your sins are forgiven because it really is the body and blood of Jesus, right? And so we want that for people. We want people to receive that gift, right? Uh, and so when we repurpose that, as a means of evangelism, we cheapen it, and it usually ends up over time turning into something else. Right? Now, obviously, Paul's addressing some obvious problems in the church at Corinth. You got people draining the whole thing, not leaving anything for anyone else, getting drunk and all that. Those we obviously recognize as bad. But he also goes on to say later in 1 Corinthians 11, and this is kind of where we got to last time, is that those who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgments on themselves. Right? So why do we not give communion to anyone? Not just to anyone. Because we're mean? To protect them. Right. right. And the thing is, we have this mental mode about literally everything except for church. Okay. So your child just turned, was it, do you, do you start doing permit driving when you're 15 at this point? 16. Okay. So your child just turned 16 and now they can permit drive. Are you just going to let the them keys. go? Give them the keys? <laughs> Why not? And why are you afraid of them driving a car when they don't know what they're doing? Because you didn't know what you were doing. Because they're going to hurt themselves. <laughs> well, I know, right? You've got some knowledge, but they're going to hurt themselves, right? Or when you start a new job, they don't just give you the tools to all of the equipment because you don't know how to work any of it. And you're going to hurt yourself and somebody else, right? So why in church should we expect that everyone's going to understand everything they hear or that they should? And that they should be invited to every aspect of life of the church when they don't even know if they're part of the community. Where did that thinking come from? Because that for the vast majority of the history of the church, that was never present, even in our own country. I think we've been. I, I, I guess C.S. Lewis would probably refer to this as the great divorce. We have separated, in many areas, the, the ceremony that points to the truth from the truth. In so many areas of our life, it's, it, it's not even just churchy stuff. It's all of Western Civ, where we have, have taken, um, oh, you know, uh, everything from education on down. And instead of it all pointing to the truth, it's sort of serving other things now. We still want the ceremony of it serves, all that tradition. It serves one other thing now. There's one thing that all of those things serve in common. It's not God, us. It's me. Right? And the point you're making is, is well taken, right? What I'm, what I'm trying to get you to realize is a lot of these desires to have what I want when I want it on my own terms do not come from the scriptures, do not come from church. They come from our culture. And right now, 
We're seeing them manifest in many other places besides church. And so you can see when we hyper-individualize communion, where that comes from, because the scriptures doesn't talk that way. So where did we get that language? Where did we get the idea that, well, I know what it means, so it doesn't matter about anything else. Well, it's not new because both uh, Pontius Pilate and modern society think it, what is true? It's yeah, it isn't new, right? Because we're now an army of one. But this means that we, that this is part of what we use the scriptures to do, right? We use the scriptures to examine where our own thinking has come from. Right? So just because I'm thinking something and because I've thought about for 20 years in church doesn't mean that it has anything to do with church. And just because somebody's new and they thought of something doesn't mean that they don't know what they're talking about. How do we test that? Go to the scriptures. Right? So when we talk about communion, what drives our desire to want to be able to offer communion to anyone and everyone? The scriptures talk about communion in that way? But that has nothing to do with communion. It is true that we want everybody to believe, right? It says God desires that all are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We know we're blessed by it. One other people are blessed by it, but there, I guess there's no shortcut. Well, we're polite, and we now that we are regenerated people in Jesus, we want to echo the desires of Jesus, and it is Jesus' desire that all come to faith, the knowledge of the truth. And so, when we receive good gifts from God, we want other people to receive those good gifts as well. But we can't just stop there and then say. So come on in, because the scriptures doesn't stop there, right? And so we're forced to confront what the Bible says about that and then wrestle through that. We talked a little bit two weeks ago about this, where it's like, like a lot of the stuff that I'm talking to you about, particularly the things that I know some of you in your own mind are questioning or wondering about, I would much rather not have to think about that. I would much rather not have to make those decisions. But in the words of Martin Luther, my conscience is captive to the word of God. So when he was brought before the highest authority on the planet and was told to recant his writings, he said, unless you can tell me from the scriptures what I'm doing that's not in line with them, I can't do it. Not I won't, I can't. Because if the scriptures are the word of God and we're the followers of Jesus, we can't pick and choose what we like about what he says. Because he's the Lord. Give us the history of Jesus Church. We obviously know on first happened. Sure. So the so um, to give, I'll give you kind of that's a I mean, we could do a whole spring long class on the, on the history of communion of the church. So I'll give you kind of a, a summary overview. The earliest writings that we have, um, which do indicate that the things that are being written about had been practiced before they were written. Um, and fairly commonly among churches is that this, the worship service was centered around the word and the breaking of the bread is the way it's described in the New Testament church. Breaking of the bread, of course, is the Lord's Supper. Okay. And that's why Paul is writing to a first century church in Corinth about the rules of the Lord's Supper. And notice that he doesn't go and explain what all the terms mean because he can assume they know what he's talking about which means that it's a common practice at the time among the early church, right? Uh, now, somewhere along the line with the advent of the Roman Catholic Church and the splitting of the East and the West, communion became something that was largely done by priests, and the congregation did not participate in it. So you weren't, you weren't actually consuming the elements. And there became a sort of wrong way of, of reverencing the elements, a confusion of like this is Jesus body and blood and so people worshiped the host and so there's stories of people hopping from church to church in near areas so that they can be around the host and worship the host a lot right and um, and that really doesn't seem to be 
to our understanding, the intention of Christ in establishing the Lord's Supper in the Scriptures. We're much more now in line with what the early church was practicing, what Paul was writing to in First Corinthians. So there's been some variation of practice there. And we talked last time about good, better, and best. There's still variation of practice today, right? Um, that, like, if you're here, I'm assuming you're here because you think this is best. And I would hope, as my vicarage supervisor said, if you find Jesus present more faithfully somewhere else, let me know. Because that's where I want to be too. Right? The reason I'm here is because that's what I think about here. So we got to make that our goal, right? Because these issues, especially, are they're related to emotion that can be very contentious because there's history and there's personal relationships at stake. So I'm not pretending that's not there. But if we make our goal the pursuit of the scriptures and Christ's intention and will for this gift, and that in recognition that it belongs to him, that it's no longer me versus you, it's us working together to figure out what does the Bible actually say about that makes sense. Because you get into the medieval church, there was a few interesting practices in the West. And one of them was a screen that divided members of the church from the non-members. And the non-members were invited for Service the word, yeah. but not for the service of the supper. Right. And um, that was kind of a cool distinction, but a less cool distinction was, um, I think it was one of the problems uh, Jan Hughes had that um, only the bread was offered and not the wine yes. to the to the conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are there are even times where the church practiced not just like a physical barrier separation, but where those who were not members were asked to leave after the service of the word, and then the service of the sacrament was celebrated with only the members. Of the um, when I was in Germany, the church that I attended there while I was doing a study abroad at a Lutheran seminary there, you would go to church prior to church to register for communion. And so you would go to church before the service started, and the pastor and the, the elder that would be assisting were back in the sacristy. And you'd go in about groups of 20, 25, and you'd write everybody's names down, and then you would say a, a prayer, and then you would go out and the next group would come in. And that was their way of measuring how many of the elements they would need for the service. But do you think that if you're visiting a church, you would have any idea that that was what you needed to do? No, right? So that practice sort of naturally dealt with some of those questions. Right? Um, but even, even up to, I don't know the exact timing in our culture. I would imagine it's somewhere in the middle of the 20th century. Even up to about that time, if let's say you're a Lutheran and your cousin's a, your cousin's a Presbyterian, if you went to their church, you would have no intention or expectation of receiving communion. And they wouldn't at your church either. Right? So what changed from 1940 to 2022? Did the Bible change? What changed? Attitudes, right? And as 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 Jeanine pointed out, it wasn't just in the church. It, it, we're seeing it elsewhere, right? That this attitude of um, sort of libertinism does not come from within the church. It comes from the world. Right? And part of what we're supposed to be on guard against. And not on guard against so that we, you know, you are barring the door and say, ah, you can't come in. You don't have the right set of things, right? But there's sort of a natural on-ramp here, because even when you would separate out the, the members from the non-members, the non-members were invited to which part of the service? The word. What is the purpose of the service of the word? By hearing. By hearing what? The gospel. The gospel, right? And so the primary goal there is the Holy Spirit working through the word to maybe create faith in somebody, and also to teach, right? Because th those are the charges that Jesus gives to his disciples, right? So a lot of times we get rid of all these splitting hair rules in pursuit of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And 
teaching them all that I have commanded you. That's always a question, right? The question, does Const did Constantine really create a bigger church, right? The question between the visible church and the invisible church, right? So let's say, um, how many of you have ever attended or gone to a church that has more than 2,000 people in it? Just, you, you maybe attended a service there, you weren't a member necessarily, but have you ever been in a worship experience like that? Okay. If you have, or maybe you've watched Joel Olstein preach on TV in his amphitheater with 35,000 people. Do you think all the people that come to those services are there for Jesus? We're fairly certain the answer to that is no. Now, you get yourself in trouble when you try to count and determine on an individual basis. That's not our purview, right? Our purview is to set things up as faithfully as possible in order that we're being honest with you about what Jesus is calling you to. So this church and another church that I was a part of, having been a person who came in after times of conflict, I can tell you that part of the conflict arose because this was ignored. Because in both cases, churches had large chunks of members who were not catechized in what their church actually believed. And when that became an issue, you had a huge fight on your hands. And I've seen it happen with my colleagues that are around my age in the ministry. They'll be called to a church, LCMS church. We were all trained in the same seminaries. And all of these churches have the same sort of constitutional based things that we agree as members of the LCMS to abide by the, the scriptures as the inherent word of God and the Lutheran confessions as faithful expositions of it. Yeah. And when you became a member of the congregation, you also said that. Maybe you missed it, but you did. That was one of the things you said yes with the help of God to. And they, they get a pastor, and the pastor starts doing communion the way the scriptures say, and the congregation revolts. And in some cases, they drive that pastor out. What happened? They didn't know their own confession of faith. Or they had a new one, and they should no longer have been in LCMS church. So you got a confusion of witness then, not just about communion, but in general. Right. So the question that we're really asking here is, where does the authority of our practice lie? And what are we in pursuit of? And communion is one of the places it comes to a head because it's one of the very visible inclusive versus exclusive activities. But it's really, I would wager, not really about communion itself. It's about whether or not you're going to subject your own will to God's word or you're going to subject his word to your will. Is that right? Well, for each different denomination, denomination, they do the Lord's Supper, how they yeah. So that's okay. However, that church does it. It's okay. However, we would do it. That's okay. Whatever. So when you go to that church, you probably shouldn't take communion because you don't know what they really do. Well, the question you should ask yourself anytime you're visiting a church that is a that is a church that has a different confession than yours, is am I comfortable saying two different things about the body and blood of Jesus? Because that's what you're doing. Right, so you're doing a public act with deep meaning that communicates something specific, right? And so, if I'm a Lutheran person and I and I have my confession here, and I go and visit my grandma or my friend or my cousin or whatever, and I go to their church and they're Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian, and they have a different confession of faith, if I participate, I am confessing their faith. But it's okay for him for them to do it how they do. Keep it well, so that's a tricky question. I mean, it's okay in the sense that I, I have no right to march into their church and demand they do any different. But it's not okay in the sense that I think it's a lesser practice than what we do. Right? That's why we do the good, better, best stuff. We, we're, not, we're not here claiming Lutherans have everything 100% right and everybody else is screwed. Right? 
heaven would be a lonely place. <laughs> um, and, God's, and God's mercy is greater than that, right? So we're not, when, and this is, I think, one of the issues that people have is when we're, when we're talking about this, these specifics here, we're not in any way claiming that we can inhibit God's work in the world. He's going to do what he's going to do, right? And he may work outside of the bounds of what he's given us to do. But the question is, what has he given us to do? And what he's given us to do is to baptize and teach and live according to his commandments, right? And so our goal is to do that as best as we can. So is it okay that they do something different in the, in the, in the, in the sort of under the umbrella of God's mercy? Yeah, it's okay. It's not like we have to take it upon ourselves to march down the road and sort of force them to do it the way we think is correct. But usually people take that then too far and say it doesn't matter. And that's also not true. Right? Otherwise, why don't you go to church there instead of here? Right? And like, if I was honestly looking for the truth, that would be a question I would ask you. Well, why do you go to that church? And if your answer is like, well, it's not really different than any other, they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So, and then, and then all of the answers you're left with is, well, I like the people and they make me happy and, and all these things, which are fine initially, but if you're genuinely seeking like deep meaning of the sacred things of the universe, I like the people runs out pretty quick, right? Especially when the people behave like sinners and then they're not so nice. Right? Um, and that's why, like, I think in a lot, like over a long period of time, and this wasn't like a nefarious thing, it just sort of happened incre incrementally. And somewhat naturally, this is the cycle we see in the Old Testament as well. So we're, we're not extra special people of God. We're that same brand that God brings back to himself. And then we screw up and fall away and chase after other things. And then in his mercy, he's like, all right, well, come on, come on back. Right? And sometimes his, his method of bringing us back is more pleasant than others. Right? Um, so that, that's really kind of the nature of this thing. So I wanted to make that point today that while we're talking about communion specifically here, the issues that we're having are not isolated there. It's really not about community. It's really about a general disposition towards God and the church. Is God Lord? Is Jesus Lord and is his word the truth or not? If it is, that changes how I do communion and everything else. If it isn't, that changes how I do communion and everything else. Yeah, Jim. We kind of went through this in Taylor's confirmation class, and I, I feel like I know this time. So I never asked you, is there any other denominations besides Lutheran that believe it how we believe, or are we standing alone from everybody? So else? there's there's one other Lutheran denomination in the United States that we are so we have we have what's called altar and pulpit fellowship. So when it, when it's related to communion. We can only commune with people that we have altar and pulpit fellowship. Now, the altar fellowship is referring directly to the practice of worship and communion. And pulpit fellowship would mean that we agree enough to where their pastors could come preach at our churches and our pastors could go preach at theirs. Okay. So that's a very deep level of unity, which is why we don't share it with a lot of other denominations. Um, I think it's the AALC. So there's an ALC, American Lutheran Churches. It's the American Association of Lutheran Churches that we share a fellowship with. Now, across the globe, there are many. So, um, I'm just saying, like, if I was going to go to another church, there, you know, like, I couldn't go into the first Presbyterian church. Correct. And expect them to believe everything. Sure. Thing, correct. Okay. Um, and, the, like, there are some non denominational churches that may get close, but they're non-denominational because they don't want to be tied to anything, including a particular confession, which is sort of antithetical to the way we think. We're like, why not? And in reality, you do have a confession. You're just not saying it all together. Because if I went in there and said, well, if this is true from Scripture, they'd say, well, no. And what, on what basis? Well, we believe that's a confession. Right? Um, we just wrote ours down in particular. And so when you became a member, he said, I believe the scriptures are the word of God, and our particular confession from the scriptures is faithful. Okay. Um, so Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, we're not, we're, 
we can do service with them. We can pray with them. You know, you can be friends with them. You can have deep and abiding friendships with them, family with them, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's not like a, you don't know, have to shun them. But when it comes to yeah. And in most of those places too, like they wouldn't let me come preach. And they shouldn't. Because I mean, I would preach something different than what they believe is true. That's why we're not in the same church in the first place. Which, like, sometimes people really lament that. They're like, why can't we all just get along? And that's always been an illusion, even when the Catholic Church was the one, one holy Catholic Church. Um, they just burn people alive who said differently for a long time. So when you do that, nobody dissents. Yeah. I mean, would you? Nope. Yeah, right? So it wasn't that there weren't people going to their churches that believed different things. They did. Because, and you could do that today. You could find some, go into the canon law in the Catholic Church, find some, some things the Pope says are true, and then talk to your Catholic friends, and they'll be like, well, you believe that? <laughs> Yeah. Right. yeah. And that, that's true, by the way, in Lutheranism as well, which is why there's some issues when you get new pastors who come in and they start doing Lutheran things in their congregations. Like, that's Lutheran. I had, a, I had a person, a faith, very faithful member of my previous church. He'd attended there for 12 years, and like three generations of his family were there. And he had no idea that there would never be a female men's church. He just never, never talked about it, never did. Uh, Ron. I remember when I first joined the Lutheran Church way back in the early eighties. Uh, for some reason, after about a year and a half, I was elected president. <laughs> what do you mean? So for my first council meeting, you know, there's all the different Nelson churches in the area. The cars. I said, "Why can't we just all get together in one church?" They all looked at me and said, "All we would ever do is argue about yeah. how we do things in our specific church." It's right. different than how they we all believe the same thing, sure. but you just do certain things a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. Well, and your and your like your rights of communion would be a sham. And so would baptism. Because you'd be at an assembly of people where half of them be like, well, it's not really that important. It's just a reminder of what Jesus did a long time ago. And other people are like, oh, it's super important. Like so, so one group might say, Well, we should only do communion once every two months because if we do it every week, well, it's not really special. And well, what are you based on? Well, it's not really, it's not a thing in and of itself that has power. It's just a reminder of the thing that happened that, that had the power. So it doesn't matter that much. Then you have another group that says, well, no, we should have it every week because it's literally the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. And I need the forgiveness of my sins like as often as I can get it, man. Right? And then you would, you would eventually have exactly the same thing we have now. All those people would leave and they'd form their own church and they'd call their own pastors. Welcome to 2022. Right. I mean, like, so the the people that just say, can't we all just get along and can't we just do stuff together? I, I've never understood that because then they're they're sort of undercutting their own confession of faith as if it's not that important. Right? Now, there are certain things where it is petty for you to be like, oh, I can't associate with you. You say the I instead of your. Right? Again, how do we measure that? Is it important? Who's defining important? Scripture. Jesus. Right? And so if something is important, and it was important enough in the case of communion that Paul wrote a letter to the church in Corinth about a lot of these issues, including communion, and say, well, I say that it's the Lord's Supper when you get together. I won't. Because it's not. Because you're not doing it the right way. Right? Um, and so for us, especially because that's one of our sacraments. It's one of the gifts given from God for you. And all it took was the death of the, the sinless son of God to give it to you. That's a big deal. And so if we don't, we don't share that, it's worth it to us to be like, well, we're going to do it the way that we think it's faithful and true. I don't know that it's, a, I don't even know that it's a, 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 an emotional issue. And I think people turn it into an emotional issue you know, fencing the table and all that <laughs> because it's easier to go access emotion than it is um, knowledge or education. I don't know that people, I don't know that your run of the mill 
Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic actually knows what their church believes and teaches. Sure. So if they did, they would probably understand where the boundaries are better in a less of course, they might go to a different church in a, in a less charged yeah. way. I think they get emotionally charged because a lack of understanding. No, okay, so so where does that come from? That, so my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge comes to mind. Right. So where does that desire come from? So let's say you're one of the members of our church that's never come to Sunday Bible class. Why do you think you never come to Sunday Bible class? Or if you weren't going to come, what would be your reason? Maybe. Schedule things at that hour. Okay, scheduling. I got something I got to run off to. Okay. So over my head. So over my head. Okay. I'll look stupid. I'll look stupid. Okay. What else? Feel like you're not all figured out. Okay. Yeah. Or it's not important to them. It's not important. Maybe some people don't realize the importance of it. Maybe they don't realize the importance of it. How would we dissuade them of that notion? Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as, as, as much as we laugh at that, we've been trying that for a long time. How's it working? It works. It works. Are you sure? It's not, I mean, it's not a bad strategy. We get a few people that way. How many of you are here because of the donuts? <laughs> As Cooper takes a great big bite. <laughs> so let me get a few that way, right? We'll probably have, right? Okay, coffee. All right, a few more. Now, what are we up to percentage wise of our people at the Bible class? Ascension actually has a really good percentage. You got about 25, 30%. That's only if you compare it to other churches, not if you compare it to the economy. Yes. But that's, I mean, so, so, so we have to ask ourselves, well, what is, what is the goal of this, and where do these desires come from? Right, we keep coming back to that. Right. So, where does the desire come from that? Well, I've got something I've got to run off to. Does it come from the Bible? No. Where does it come from? I want to do what I want to do. Ah. I want to do what I want to do. I want to have it all. That's usually the American thing. Right. I want to be able to be in 17 sports, three after school clubs, still teach my kids about Jesus, have dinner every night at the dinner table, have meaningful conversation, and not give anything up. Sorry to burst your bubble. Can't do that. It's impossible. That's not going to happen. Right? And so that's why we have priorities. And what drives our priorities are values. And we get our values from truth. And where do we as Christians get our truth from? Why? Right? So again, what we're doing here is we're subjecting ourselves to the word of God. So even if it's my deepest desire to not do this thing, if the Bible says I need to do it, then I better fight my deepest desire until I die so that I do what the word says. Because under that assumption is that God knows better than I do. And if you don't follow that assumption, the underlying assumption is, as we talked about, it serves who? Me. And my desires, my will, and my plan. So in our gospel reading today, the disciples had a plan. They had a plan not just for themselves, but for Jesus. How did it work out for them? Jesus said, sorry, it's not your plan. It's my plan. And don't worry, you'll thank me later. Has anyone thought about that? That really struck me when I was, when I was preparing for the sermon today. Imagine if Peter got his way. Imagine. We would all be toast. <clears throat> oh, anybody here not a Gentile? Peter got his way. We're not of the people of God. So our way is not great. Right? That's why Jesus had to come in the first place. And so... The act of the Christian life, this is why it, it's sort of described as a cross your bearing. Because you're, you're, the part of yourself that rails against God is being crucified along with Jesus, which is sometimes super unpleasant. But that's the, that's the sort of core of the Christian life. Okay? And in communion, 
that means that if it's the Lord's table, I do what? What he says, not what I want, not what I say. Right? And then again, how do we measure that? Word. Uh, yeah. Just because it came up in the possible reading where you know he said it saw my spoke to you guys like figure of speech. Yeah. The time is coming where you can tell it straight out. Yep. You ever struggle to identify those times as you're reading it? That's a good question. I do. So that's one of the reasons that like in our church body. Like the reason that Pete had to leave in May is because he's taking Greek and Hebrew in the summer. And we do that and we require that. We're one of the only denominations that still fully require you to do that to become a pastor in our churches because we want to know the language so that we can make those, those distinctions. Right? So we can look at the Greek and it says, okay, this is my body. The only way I can get representation from there is if I read something into it via my reason. Doesn't make sense to me. He must have meant X, right? As opposed to, this is my body. What it says. And if you look at the original language, that's what it says. It doesn't say it is like. And we have other examples in scripture to compare it to, right? Pharaoh's heart is hard as stone. Does it literally mean his heart was made out of stone? And you use context the way we use regular language, right? If I say, um, my foot is, you know, I hit that guy with my foot like a club. I don't literally mean my foot's a club, right? It's just a, an image, an allegory, right? So we determine with the way it's constructed and the context that it's given in, whether it's a figure of speech. Now, that's mostly in reference to the, the teaching in parables, right? Um, and so and there's even a part, I'm trying to remember, either Luke or John, when he says, he even takes them aside and says to his disciples, I spoke in parables because it's not given them to know yet, but it is given you to know, so I'm going to explain to you what it means. Um, but, what does he say? He says, the time is coming where I'll no longer speak in such fashion. Right? And part of that is this new life that we have in Jesus. Okay. So he's not he's not making a linguistic shift. What's happening is they receive the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does is reveals the truth of all the things that Jesus had said. That's one of the things he specifically says when you receive the Holy Spirit, it will help bring to remembrance all the things that I have said to you. And so one of the reasons that we believe the Bible is the authoritative word of God is that it was inspired by the Spirit. Because you might say, well, it stands to reason that John might have forgotten some of the important details. Makes sense. Do you remember what you had for lunch last Tuesday? <laughs> right? So it stands to reason that, okay, maybe he missed details, right? Well, we believe that's not the case because the Holy Spirit. Gave the recollection of all that Jesus had said. Um, and that's a good example of where my reason is tempted to say, well, that's not really what he meant. So am I going to subject my reason to the word God or am I going to subject the word God to my reason? Right? And for Lutherans, when those two come into clash, who has the higher authority? The word does. Right? So that's where it's like, explain to me the Trinity or how the body and blood is present in the bread and wine. Anyone? You'd make history if you could. Nobody's been able to yet. By faith, you believe those to be true, right? So they're beyond our understanding. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Ask a question. I just, I don't know, man. We're, we're talking about like the enormity of God in uh -huh. general. It just hit me like, how did you know what I mean? I but those are those are good things to bring to your mind often because they're reminders 
Like now, the next time you might be tempted to think you know something and that you've got the plan for the future, you'll remember. The last time I tried to think about God, my brain started to melt. <laughs> <laughs> you said it like, how do we even talk something that's bad? Yeah. Yeah, I love, for me personally, like I, I say that the, the throne room of the King of the Universe a lot because to me that just brings sort of like when I'm kneeling next to my bed in prayer, I'm in the throne room of the King of the Universe. Like that's just crazy talk. That's an amazing one, right? Because imagine what it would take for you to just get into the throne room of a, a king on earth. It's a uh, process, and like 90% of the time, what are they going to tell you? No. You've got no place here. You don't belong here. Right? And God has even more right to tell you that, and it would still be true. And yeah, you don't have any, you don't have any right to be here. I don't need to give you any time, Dave. And he does. Cool. Okay. We have a handout. In case you didn't. Um, so part of the reason I gave you the long version of this handout is It'll help you go through if you've got the catechism later on, if you're looking for some of the particulars. And if you run into anything there, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, but we covered the first page. We're on the top of the next page here. Um, so we're talking about testament. So this is one of this cup, the New Testament in my blood. What does the word testament mean? So here's a little excursus on that. So the liter literary use of, of the word testament is a collection of writings, of biblical writings. So we, what do we call the big part of the, the older part of the uh, biblical canon? The Old Testament. And what do we call the new one? Yeah, the, new the New Testament. Yeah, we're very creative name givers. Um, right? uh, the theological use of a testament is a type of promise or covenant or testament. Right? Um, and a really cool linguistic thing in Hebrew... I maybe a share. I, I say this in confirmation sometimes. I don't know if I share with you guys or not. But the verb for to form a covenant is the same verb used to describe cutting. It's an etched promise. It's not a promise written down a race. It's a permanent thing. And so you'll notice that whenever God makes a covenant with his people, what happens? What's involved? A sacrifice. And what happens to a sacrifice? It gets cut. Right? So to Abraham, the sacrifices are cut in half. Right, and a floating censure goes between all of them. Right, so it's a and and it's marked with what? Blood. Right, why blood? It's life. Right, so is this a heavy promise or a light promise? It's a heavy promise, right? The heaviest that you can get. Right, so that's what the testament is here. Right, that's why I say this is the New Testament in my blood. A new promise in my blood. Right? So Old Testament describes a conditional promise of the law. We are condemned by this old covenant when we break God's law. Right? And so part of what I read in the, in the sermon today from Leviticus, Leviticus 16. You had to do all that stuff because you were condemned by God's law and you were unclean. Right? And why did he have to do all that stuff? So that he didn't die just for being in the presence of God. Um, I'm really thankful I don't have to be blessed. <laughs> uh, the New Testament describes the unconditional promise of the gospel. We are saved by this new covenant as we trust in it. So the old covenant was a promise made through the sacrifice, the sacrificial blood of animals, and like constantly, like I remember sometimes when I read the Old Testament. How do they have any? Oh, that's kind of five minute morning. Um, how do we have any animals left? They're like killing sheep and bulls and goats all over the place. How do they have any left? The Middle East does right. not have smell very good. Yeah. <laughs> Weren't they also eaten after they were sacrificed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but after everything was served, still sprinkled with it. Animals still couldn't smell very good in the sun. Nope. So. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31. So open the Bible, Jeremiah 31, 33, 31 through 34. Um, we're going to look at evidence for of the New Testament promise in the Old Testament writing. So some people think they're like totally separate worlds. Right? God of the Old Testament, God of the New. Uh, and we say, nope, 
all of scriptures are pointing to who? Christ. Right? He's been present from the very beginning, and he's been the promise given from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, since we've got somebody watching online, I'll read it so they can hear. So starting at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Doesn't sound like the old covenant. Right? Um, so, and notice that each moment of the covenant, these big covenant moments, they are defined by a great act of deliverance. So he references the great act of deliverance in the Old Testament. What was that? The Exodus, right? The, the freeing of God's people from slavery in Egypt through, through the prophet Moses, right? Um, and bringing them to the promised land. He's doing the same with you. He's freed you from your slavery to sin and is leading you to the promised land, right? And that promise, just like it was in the Old Testament, is marked by blood. In this case, Jesus' own blood. Right? So when you come to communion, you're participating in that promise by literally taking that into your body, by participating in the sacrifice, right? Because as we pointed out, did they just throw the animal carcasses out in the Old Testament? No, it was consumed, right? Same with the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb was consumed so that they were under the protection of that sacrifice. So are we? All right. Any final questions you might have about communion? We're running out of time. And uh, I want to, I'm trying to be better about not being like 15 minutes over. Yeah, Trish. I have a question, Pastor. Um, the ELCA changed some of their thinking, not about communion, but just about the different things they agreed to do. Yep. And so because of those things, I felt I couldn't stay in that group anymore. Yeah. But had I stayed and took communion, am I now not really taking communion for what I believe? Because I don't believe what they're doing. Um, so you're sort of dividing yourself against yourself is what you're doing when you do that. So this is why... When you're, when you're somebody who's called to be a pastor and you like inundate your life with theology, you can ask my wife, it's probably really annoying. Literally everything is about that. So when I see TV commercials, it's about that, right? And, and it does, and, it, and often it, it is. They may not think it is, but it is, right? So as an example, in a cell phone commercial where they're talking about how in the old days you had to get a family plan to have a discount on your cell phone. And so there's a husband and wife they're not really husband and wife, they're just two people. And it's like they accidentally had like four children together so they could have a cheaper cell phone bill. And their kids are running around throwing crap on the walls and driving them crazy. And they look utterly miserable. And then the product that's going to save you for them, now you don't have to do that anymore. And they show like a really attractive single 40 year old woman who has no one in her home and it's perfect. What do you think they're trying to tell you? They keep messing it up. That it's, that it's better to be solitary than family. Yeah. People are messy. They're annoying. Kids are annoying. They're a hassle. You should just be single and alone. And live in a nice, happy, collected place. But is that true? No, it's a lie. Right? Not everybody is miserable who's in their mid-40s and has no family, but most people who are, are. I talk to them. What you think is good for you when you're 22 turns out not to be so great for you when you're 50. But by then, some of those decisions are too late. Right? So with, with that, you're sort of dividing yourself against yourself. 
it doesn't make any sense. So when you're seeing everything theologically, if your measuring stick is the scriptures, then what you do when you realize that's happening, what should you do? Me. Go to a different church. Well, I think first you try to get the train on a different track. And then when that fails, you sure. Sure. Because that. Sure. I, I, that, that that's, that's what I did. That's a good that's point. What I did. With the yeah. ELC. And most people who will most people who will be able to recognize that disconnect okay. won't just fail. Because yeah. they're usually people who are seriously thinking about the faith. Right? So they'll do that naturally. They'll be like, uh, Pastor, I've noticed that the Bible, you said this the other day, the Bible says that precisely nowhere. So where is that coming from? <laughs> right. Uh, and then he might give you his argument and explanation, and you might think, I don't buy that. Okay. And the more that happens, then the less likely you are to stay there. Well, so that's what I mean. The pat, the pat answer is the way we see love today, which is commanded by Scripture, is X, Y, and Z. Right. So yeah. that that was sort of the pat answer every time I asked those questions. Sure. And and when you ask enough of those, you start digging underneath that and you find where that comes from is that like well, the way I look at this is I'll take the stuff that I like and then I'll explain away the stuff that I don't like. And that's how they, they fell on the Bible contains the word of God. The Bible is not the word of God. Right. Right. And so like through your questioning, you'll find those four things out and then you'll decide. I don't buy this. I'm, this isn't this isn't what I believe, and so I'm going to start looking for a place that does right. And a lot of the stuff that I've encountered for like people who've newly joined our church here, and just people I know who have recently started thinking more about the, about faith, they're like one phrase I've heard a ton is like preaching faithfully from the scriptures, because it's that. Or the other thing, and after a while, the other thing, no matter where it's at, all starts to sound the same. And when that well runs dry, it doesn't take long, because the way that you would describe someone like a Joel Steen is, his theology is a mile wide and about an inch deep. And so once you get in the pond, it's a pretty boring place to be. There's nowhere to go. So he may have 40,000 people in his amphitheater, but he's got 10,000 leaving every week and 10,000 coming in because there's nothing to do once you get in there. He's saying the same thing everyone else is. And so that's where, that's my encouragement. That's, I mean, that's why we call this Bible study. It's we're, we're orienting ourselves around the word. We're subjecting ourselves to it by learning what it means, what it says, and how to live according to it, right? And it's, it, I'm not, I'm not, uh, dismissing the difficulty of that when it says something difficult and something that there's a part of me that really wishes is the case that that happens to me too right and so i'm not saying that that's not going to happen but when it does it may wrestle back and forth but the winner has to be the bible all right well we'll close it there um, i'll stick around and answer any questions we still have some questions but i want to let people Go and then we're going to have our little family small group meeting here. So, um, so let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all of the gifts that you have given us the gift of the church, started by your disciples, and the gifts, the means of grace that you continue to give us to this day that sustain our faith in you. Help us as we strive to the best of our ability and by your leading to be faithful to your word to remember and learn the things that you have taught us so that we can do our best to live according to you. And in so doing, may your, your image, your love, your truth, your words be reflected in what we do so that more and more people may come to know you, that more and more people may be able to join us at your table to receive the forgiveness of sins through your body and your blood. To that end, Lord, create in us a zeal an ardor for those we care about, to lift them up in prayer to you, to have them on our minds, to speak to them in love, truth, and gentleness. Be with us this summer as we take a break from our gathering for Bible study. Help us to continue to seek out your word on our own, to read the scriptures, and to continue to be shaped by them. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.